Hello, my delicious co-creators. Lilu here on the Juicy Living Tour. I am in uh, Mills Valley. Is that right? Mill Valley? Mill Valley. Uh-huh. Beautiful. Right outside of San Francisco and um, through Deborah that uh, you've just maybe seen that interview that I just done with her on the book writing and on those amazing advice. And I just love Deborah. And I'm so excited that she introduced me to, to you, Josh, and we can have this conversation delicious conversation i know because of all the traveling and just uh, we talked here about japan already and had this wonderful tea and and you're passionate about yoga and sanskrit and i know it's going to be a wonderful conversation just looking at your eyes i can tell so much about somebody's eyes huh? <laughs> fantastic i'm happy to be here and you have those tattoos and this gorgeous chocolates and it's just so many beautiful things. So what is when does all this started for you? Because you seem there's really a special energy about you. And, you know, a lot of us think that we were born this way. But sometimes we have to kind of through difficulties find back this this beautiful kind of energy where we come from, you know, through difficulty. Was that have you ever be, always been like that or was that a process? I think the door opened for me pretty early on. I found meditation at age 14, and so I, it just came to me. I was an athlete, and I wanted to, I was a springboard diver, and so a lot of it, in, you know, incorporated visualization, and this was way before any sports psychology, and Uh, I just found meditation first was uh, I used for athletics, and then I just realized the byproducts of that were I was much more peaceful. I was much more attuned to what I was feeling and also what other people were feeling. Wow. So meditation opened the door. Yeah. And then you start traveling then. How did you enrich your experience, or how did you, where did you start going to, to, to learn and, and, and get this philosophy? Well, I think the ultimate place I traveled was within. I mean, that's the ultimate, that's the ultimate travel. But I got interested in Japan pretty early on. Japan, something about it just spoke to me. The beauty, the harmony, the ancient, meeting the modern. And so I went to college and I was an athlete and I, I took that about as far as I, as I thought I could. And then my third year of college, I decided I'd take off and go to Japan. So I spent a year in Japan, which was just completely eye-opening soul opening yeah and, and that some of those places where we go like our soul feel called to it we don't know why and then once we're there in those places there is uh, chunks whatever it's karma or past lives or whatever but it's something where we really grow fast huh yeah i felt like i was coming home for the first time that's what it felt like it was familiar and unfamiliar at the same time yeah, yeah it was beautiful and then where when did this uh, the, the yogi practice came in well i had I was practicing Aikido, so I was practicing the Japanese martial art, and uh, I loved it, but it was pretty difficult on the body, so I was pretty injured. I had lower back pain and, and all of this, and then when I had gotten back from Japan, I decided to go to graduate school at uh, what was the Naropa Institute in Boulder, and uh, there was a fantastic yoga teacher there, a guy named Richard Freeman, so I started studying yoga with him, and it, it started to unlock the pain that I had in my body. And I realized that yoga was a psychology as well. So what started out as physical practice became a path for understanding how the world worked, which was something I had been involved with since I was a kid. Do you feel that's part of the, or the main practice that brings you to higher vibration? Because I definitely can feel this in this place and that there is something about you that brings that also. How do you, how do you relate to that? How does that happen? I think part of it is just that it's always been there and that it's, that life becomes a process of uncovering what's already there. Um, And then there are certain things that I think are catalysts. Certainly yoga practice has been a catalyst because it's a path for purifying. It's a path for meeting yourself daily. And um, yeah, and seeing those parts that maybe you don't always want to see. Yeah. <laughs> um, and meditation. And But life can become that. It's like almost anything can, can become that. For me, music, yeah. tea, uh, true paths. What's beautiful with yoga, I feel, is that it's a, it becomes a, a lifestyle more than just a practice, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the things I, I 
found, much to my surprise, is my yoga practice and my counseling practice, my psychotherapy practice, started to merge mm. just naturally. It wasn't something that I was, you know, consciously trying to cultivate. But I realized, like, the, the philosophies of yoga had so much impact on working therapeutically with people. They worked as well and then better than than Western psychotherapeutic techniques that I was using. Mm -hmm. Because yoga is this ancient practice, practices geared on the relief of suffering. Yeah. Tell us about that practice. What does it consist of? I think, you know, yoga is really, from, from my understanding, which is just con continuing to evolve, it's basically the willingness to let go of who you think you are. And it's to unfold into more of who you really are and to be able to identify less with external circumstances and as soon as one does that then the amount of suffering starts to go down and down and down some people say you know when we ask them where is home they say it's right here so it gets into sometimes in this annoying conversation but, but really where are you from no right here right now and and sometimes it's uh, not that it's annoying to anybody that's saying that out there but it's just you know you really we have this earthy life and yet there is this feeling of being at home yes wherever we are and i definitely feel this way traveling and you know our essence and our soul and our presence is here and omnipresent but it's how do you relate to that you know I, i agree with you i mean i think there are certain places that are power spots and you where you just feel naturally aligned uh, i mean for me new york city where i was born and raised it's like when i when i am there, it feels like home, it feels incredibly peaceful. I can be in the subway, I can be on the streets with people all around me, and it just feels spacious and wonderful. Wow. Japan has that, uh, different, different places. So um, I think, you know, it's good to cultivate it internally, and then also to be where it resonates externally as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. difficult to be where it doesn't feel right. Um, you the, the the practice the tea here. What is I would love to speak a bit about the tea because we tried some the most delicious teas here and tell us how tea you know because it's very much in Asia they drink a lot of tea and there's this kind of what is the relationship between like meditation or growth and tea? Why are we seeing it so often there? Absolutely. Well, it's interesting because it's a paradox because mm -hmm. on one level. Tea is leaves and water, and that's it. So simple, almost nothing to it. But on another level, it's a metaphor for awakening. It's a metaphor for how one relates to life. So uh, one of the things I love about tea is it slows us down. Mm -hmm. It allows us to just savor the present moment. And I think so much of like the anxiety that's in the world has to do with people just not being in the present moment and just trying to like become a better version of themselves, trying to just busy, busy, busy. And like tea just reminds us to like enjoy the present moment fully. And I also think that it teaches about impermanence because every cup is different. And then when it's gone, you have to let it go. Mm -hmm. You know, and every season is different, you know, like every crop is different. And that's that's really beautiful. And it's been used, uh, you know, as a as an adjunct to meditation, probably for as long as there's been meditation. Um, so it's, you know, it's a metaphor for uh, awakened mind. Yeah. It's like healing, too. And there's something in the tea that heals us. Yeah. And it's interesting because the byproduct of tea is that it's healthy for the body, there are antioxidants, uh, but that's not why one drinks. One drinks for like the pure pleasure of entering the moment and of connecting to nature. Mm -hmm. You know, because as the tea is cultivated, you know, you're, you're paying attention even subtly to the soil, to the, the techniques that the farmers have used for generations and generations. Sometimes it's a dying art. You know, sometimes the, the children don't want to continue what the parents and grandparents have done. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then just this, yeah, it's this beautiful connection to nature. Mm -hmm. 
and it's delicious too. Oh my goodness, especially the ones that you brought back from Taiwan and all those places. Oh my goodness, very unique, very unique in a, a nice special way. I saw you warming up these cups and then it's a whole process, just so lovely dropping back in the present moment. I know you love chocolate too, and so do I, and I know many beautiful co-creators out there. And chocolate is getting also, I want to speak about that quickly, because it has this kind of, you're, you were saying, this revolution, or at least it's it just more and more people are having, I guess, different kind of chocolate types, or there's this, and in new chocolates is being brought out, like this Iceland chocolate I didn't know of. Yeah, it seems like there's a revolution of artisanal products coming out. And I think, you know, with so much in the world that's artificial, people are looking for what's real. And they're looking for what's real on so many different levels. And again, chocolate is a lot like tea in a way. It's it's one thing, it, like, a you know, the cacao, and then it's processed in a certain way that creates like a world of flavor. And now there are these small companies that are just making incredible artisanal chocolates, mm. you know, and yeah, it's, I think it's a shamanic product. Yeah. You know, it does something to consciousness, just like tea does, just like meditation does, just like Just like tattoo, huh? because you were, we were speaking earlier of tattoo too. We had all those wonderful conversation around the tea, and now we're sharing them with you because there's been all those. There's, you, tell us about how you see tattoos, because you've got those beautiful tattoos, and you even went to Barcelona to get some other ones down there uh, on the legs. I mean, uh, but tell us about what what you know how you see those tattoos. You see that as a shamanic process. I absolutely do. I think, you know, I think at its core, you know, tattooing is, it's a deeply shamanic process. It's a process where you encounter like the fundamentals of, of life, where it's beauty and permanence, impermanence, pain. Um, I, for me, I love the ritual of it. There's something about it, like as a man, childbirth I, I, is not something I can experience. And, and I'm not, uh, you know, saying tattoo is akin to it, but it's something where you have to be completely committed to the process. And um, I think in a way it's like life where pain is short, but beauty is long, yeah. you know, And uh, so it's something that I, I came to later in life. It wasn't something that interested me particularly when I was younger. And that's probably good because now like the imagery that, that I have speaks to me on a, like a very deep level and it kind of comes out of my practice. It's a, you know, sort of a celebration of like the Eastern and Western traditions that I feel my life flows between. Um, so I, you know... I love that. And it seems like they're, they're, they're like amulets. They're, they're like amulets of power, or they can be, you know, yeah. they, they can be the process and the process itself. You have to uh, talk about meditation. It draws you deeply into meditation when you're, you know, when you're going through that process. And one of the things I realized is like, if I label the sensation pain, then all of a sudden I'm in pain. But if I label it just sensation, then it becomes endlessly fascinating. Mm -hmm. Then like every line is different. Every moment is different. And you can find the still point in the middle of intense sensation. Mm -hmm. I think life's a lot like that. Yeah, you're saying it's already there too, huh? Yeah, I had this experience when I was, uh, when I went to Barcelona last year and, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little intense sometimes. So uh, I was getting tattooed uh, seven hours a day for a couple of days straight, which is a, which is a lot. And, um, but when like in the middle of like the second day, I had this experience that the artist wasn't actually putting ink into the skin. What the artist was doing was just peeling away what had covered the imagery that had always been there. And so it was this feeling like, Regardless of whether anyone has a tattoo, we're all marked. We're all marked by our experiences. Like a blueprint. Or... Like a blueprint, yeah. And it's beautiful to sometimes let that out. And when I realized, you know, when I had this vision that it was already there, I could let go of the control that said, oh, is this the right image? Oh, does it need to be? It, like all of that, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And it was just a trust that life is flowing exactly as it needs to. And that was a very profound experience. And I brought that back into my therapy practice to like work with clients to like help them to realize life is f not to control it so much, to let life flow as it needs to. 
Yeah. What are some of the uh, of others profound moments that you have and realizations wherever that was around the globe? <laughs> I you know um I had a realization in the jungles of Bali that was pretty amazing. It was right after a 6.6 earthquake where I was teaching. I was teaching Sanskrit in the middle of like the jungle and it was shaking. You know, we were on this two story and um you know as as we came back I had this I had this idea, you know, and I was sitting with like a group of 30 or 40 yoga students and I had this idea we don't do yoga. You know, that's what we say. Oh, I do yoga. I've been doing yoga eight years. I've been doing but we actually don't. That's 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 a sort of a misperception. But that yoga's always happening. That yoga is a state that's always there. But what we do is we create the conditions that allow us to align with that experience. And when I started to play with this idea of creating conditions, it it just, it seemed to open a door for me, like creating conditions where anxiety doesn't flourish, creating conditions where vitality and well-being do. So much more than I'm doing this, yeah. I'm doing that, which is like such a sense of self, which ultimately I think needs to break down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the whole conversation around we're already perfect the way we are. Why searching, searching for more? Why not just accepting ourselves and being accepting all the way yeah i have a friend of mine who's um he's a research diver in antarctica so he dives under 20 feet of ice you know one of maybe 20 people on the planet who can do that and he said in antarctica there are icebergs that are so big that they look like countries there's one that uh the water that's within the iceberg would run through the nile river for a hundred years that much water. And when you fly over it, you can't believe, literally, you cannot believe how big it is. And the thing he said is 90% of the iceberg is underwater. So what's so huge is just 10% of it. And I think that's like us. I think the parts we know about ourselves, it's about 10%. And 90% is like in the unconscious. 90% is like yet to come to the surface. So that that's exciting, mm -hmm. you know, to like go into the mystery, not to solve it, but to live it instead, like to like play with that 90% and mm -hmm. see what can come up. In your practice, what do you recommend to people going through a hard time and big fears or even panic attacks? Panic attacks is a big thing. I think I think our society is like we're addicted to busy mm -hmm. and we have this idea that we can multitask really well which we actually can't you know we we tend not to be able to and i think the fundamentals work the best i think getting back to basics of like good food enough sleep nutrition meditation breathing and then also being with what is it's it's very hard to change something that we don't own It's like trying to sell a car that you're not the owner of, you know, and, and I think when you can sit with what is, that opens the door to changing it. But so many people, they just want to change it immediately and they don't have a relationship with it. Like with anxiety, like one of the things I have people do is in my work is dialogue with it, mm -hmm. like to actually dialogue with it, to, you know, that... People, with an open mind <laughs> with an open mind rather than to try to destroy it or to try to you know because so much anxiety anxiety is so much a fear of the future you know and people's relationship with the future is very adversarial sometimes and so it's bringing people helping to bring people back into the present moment where actually there is spaciousness yeah how do you define enlightenment I think enlightenment is the realization that there's more there than meets the eye. And it's the like walking the path to that, to realize that the, the parts I know of myself are in, in a way the least. And then, but acting, acting in a way that's conscious, acting in a way that's compassionate, that's loving, that's not small minded. That to me feels like uh, enlightened action. Mm -hmm. Did you had uh, some moments where you felt really in in unity and this oneness? Could you tell us one moment where you really felt this oneness? Absolutely. You know, I think we think that that experience, which in yoga is called samadhi, 
we think that it's very rare and, and only for the few, you know, who like are lucky. But I think we have it every day. I think we have it throughout the day. And I've had it like in Kyoto, like walking through a bamboo forest where it was just, you know, I couldn't tell where the bamboo forest stopped and I started. You know, I've had it in moments of, of meditation, uh, being in nature, these, or just synchronicities that come about that just feels like yeah. this can't be random. Yeah. It's like where the universe just peels back the, yeah. the curtain for a second. A lot of people are looking for their purpose. What do you feel your purpose is and how does that feel to be on purpose? I think yeah, a lot of people are a lot of people are looking for their purpose and you know so often I think they don't find it because it's closer than they think it is. Mm -hmm. It's like right there. Um, for me it's like I love helping to inspire people and I do it in in different ways, but I love when someone has an aha moment. You know, and all of a sudden there's a peacefulness with self and there's a sense of self-acceptance. You know, it's not in the future, it's right now. And it's not based on, well, when I'm 10 pounds thinner or when I'm, you know, $10 richer or something like that. So inspiring is really, is really important to me. And, and to do it, I, I tend to look for it. So I find a lot of inspiration in many, many different places. Yeah. It's like, it's like it's there and it's there all the time and you keep on going back to it no matter what you would do and it feels just good and natural. That's it, yeah. I think it feels good and natural, yeah. yeah. And there's like not that rice we ate, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Tell me the name of that rice. That rice is called haiga rice. So it's, uh, it's an incredible thing where the je you know, the, uh, there's a process that's been developed where It's essentially white rice that has all of the nutrients of brown rice. So it has the taste of the incredible, it has the germ. It's just, you know, that science meets, uh, you know, thousands of years of farming and cultivation. Mm. Well, thank you for this delicious, juicy, potent love conversation. I loved it, Josh, and very grateful for Deborah that brought us together. So Me thank too. you. Me too. It's just a pleasure. <laughs> And to you, all my beautiful, delicious co-creators out there, my God, do we love you. And we send you so much love from this delicious place in California, wherever you are, know that you're loved, you know, and you're totally on purpose. This is happening right now. We're all opening in this beautiful, like, just <gasps> breathing this beauty all around us, huh? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> big, big kisses. Bye-bye. <laughs>